I'm Bree McKee, National Manager of Generation Liberty, which is a project of the Institute of Public Affairs dedicated to advancing the ideas of liberty and freedom among young Australians. The IPA has undertaken extensive research on the proposed voice to Parliament. Our research examines the Karma Langton voice model, looks at international experiences, particularly that of the New Zealand Maori voice to Parliament and the Waitangi Tribunal, and seeks to get a better understanding of Australians' attitudes about the voice. The upcoming referendum on The Voice has the potential to impact many generations to come, so it's important to hear from young people about what it means to them. I recently sat down with Miles Gerard, a young Indigenous man from Tinga in New South Wales, to understand and share with you his thoughts about The Voice. I hope our discussion provides new insights into this very important topic. Miles, you come from an Indigenous background. You grew up in country New South Wales. Your story so far is one of hard work and success, and you're currently partway through a law degree at the University of New South Wales and working as a paralegal in Sydney. So can you give us a brief background of some of your life challenges and opportunities and how you've got to where you are today? Growing up in Tinga, you, you, you experience a lot of the many things that Indigenous people go through. Uh, my home was exposed to uh, domestic violence, alcohol and drug abuse. I've also been exposed to not just me, but my uh, family as well, immediate family, negative run-ins with the criminal justice system. And that's just the reality. So in doing that, I um, was interested in the law and um, that's what's um, brought me to be studying a... Um, law degree at the University of New South Wales and now working at as, as a paralegal. So Miles, what do you believe is the most important part of being an Australian? I think Australia is one of the most greatest nations on the planet. I think we have such a great culture of multiculturalism. Anyone from around the world can come here in hopes of a story of success in achieving the Australian dream. We need to have that same sort of mentality in our Indigenous community. I think we're very tolerant and I think that just makes it all about easier to make a change in our communities. Do you feel that coming from an Indigenous background has made life and achievement more difficult for you? No, no, I, 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 I do believe, and it is a reality that Indigenous people are exposed to many things, but I never let my skin colour or my cultural background be something that holds me back. Yes, I did come from a life of poverty and many disadvantages, but that doesn't hold, that didn't hold me back. I think that's a testament that anyone in this country can do whatever they want if they grab the opportunities and have a hard work ethic. So Miles, The Voice is going to establish a new bureaucracy in Canberra that's only available to people based on their race. Do you believe that this is already dividing Australians? Certainly. This voice is predicated on the principle that Indigenous people are inherently disadvantaged. To enshrine that in our founding document, in our constitution, is setting us up for a future of failure. It means that my children and my children's children will always be considered disadvantaged. It sets us up for a future of self-segregation. Uh, it's setting us up for a future that tells us that Indigenous people uh, think alike and have one mind. I, I think it's also important to understand that the term Indigenous has been used as a term to put us together as a collective group. We're very, very different. We have so different... there's not just one voice? No, no, exactly. People. There's not just one voice. My people, the Camilleroy people or the Dungari people have very different experiences or very different disadvantages than the people in living remote communities in Northern Territory, the Wadalbury mob or the Yongwu people. It's very, very different. And to class us into one subset of governance is wrong. What do you believe can be done at a policy level to help Indigenous Australians to succeed in life? We need to have investments on the ground. We're spending millions and millions of dollars on this voice. We don't even know what it's going to be yet. There yes. are hundreds and hundreds of different tribes and people in one state alone. So it will be necessarily exclusive. It will be necessarily extent. exclusive. We need to be spending money on the ground, investing in Aboriginal businesses, Investing in creativity and imagination, having some sort of future that doesn't see us as a people who are always going to be oppressed. When, yes. you, when, when you base policies around that mindset, it's, ne it's never going to work. 
Many Australians are concerned that the voice being based in Canberra will have no meaningful difference for Indigenous Australians. Is this a concern you share? Absolutely. It's already creating divides in communities now, the, the debate alone. It's, it's telling people there is one singular voice for Indigenous people, and that's to be based in Canberra. We hope to achieve reconciliation. Reconciliation is based on uh, a principle of unity. How are we meant to achieve reconciliation when, one, we haven't even reconciled with ourselves, and two, this voice only seeks to divide us based on race. Miles, thank you so much for joining us today and thank you for your contributions on the debate about the voice. Thank you, Brie.